Okay, so it's a pleasure to get started. And uh, first, I would like to welcome everybody to this online virtual seminar series. Uh, this is an initiative of the SIAG uh, FME Activity Group that uh, I mean, was decided in order to keep our community cohesive and uh, hear what each other is doing during these challenging times where we don't have uh, a lot of opportunities to meet in person, uh, interact and brainstorm. And I um, mean, um, Igor and I took the lead and decided also to partner with um, Sebastian and uh, Ronnie. And uh, so we contacted the SIAM um, SIA admin administrators. Uh, Richard is here, and I would like to thank uh, Sebastian, Ronnie, and Igor for the wonderful work that has been done in setting up uh, the seminar series so quickly. Because from the time where we had the idea to when we got started, it was really like a few days. And Richard has been also very helpful and supportive in uh, helping with the infrastructure and setting the seminar up. And uh, actually, I mean, this seminar series will only benefit uh, from uh, all of you participating and interacting. So that's the old goal to make this as close as possible to an in-person seminar so that uh, we all have a chance to, to say, I mean, to ask questions to the speaker and uh, like get feedback and uh, like uh, get the community going. And I also would like to basically announce that this is supposed to run uh, two times, I mean, two times, uh, uh, two days per month. So we have like every other week seminars during the regular academic year. And uh, it's expected to continue until the next SIAM FME conference in Philadelphia 2021. And we're also planning to hold some lectures uh, during the summer, but uh, at a more moderate pace, maybe one time per month. And uh, other than that, uh, I would like to like, um, ask you to provide any feedback either to the organizers or to the members of the activity group about how the seminars is going, if you have any concerns or if you would like to improve some of the characteristics of this online series. We are all like very keen to hear your opinions and feedback and try to make this series as, uh, as good as possible for all of you. And with that said, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Matt Sooner from Princeton University. It's really a pleasure to have him uh, as the inaugural speaker of this series. And uh, Matt, the floor is yours. And Seb, please go ahead with the moderation. Okay, sure. So actually, I wanted to, um, so thank, thank you, Augustino. I, I wanted to say a few words of, uh, to introduce uh, Meta, as well as a little bit of administrative issues with respect to how the seminar is going to run. We'd like all questions to be uh, held off until the very end. We may pause in the middle just for any very short, quick question. And the way that you can ask a question is uh, we're going to just use one mode of question asking and that's entering it into the chat panel. And only the panelists up here will be able to see that. Uh, we will select uh, a subset of those to, to respond to or to, to relay to, to Meta and, um, and continue on there. From, from that point. So uh, without further ado, so you know, good morning, I guess, on the West Coast, by the way, good afternoon on the East, good evening in Europe, and if anyone in Asia is there, I guess good night. It would be, I'm very yeah. curious to see that if there anyone actually shows up from, from Asia. Uh, interesting little tidbit, there's 100, currently 185 participants online right now. Uh, there were 330 plus participants registered for the seminar. So we're quite excited to, to attract uh, quite a large audience like this. And of course, uh, one of those, the main reasons for this is the um, uh, notoriety of our first speaker, uh, Professor Soner, who is a full professor and Orphe at Princeton University. And he's uh, a member and affiliate of the Benham Center of Finance. Previously, before joining Princeton, he was a professor of mathematics and the department chair at ETH Zurich. And we all are quite familiar with his widely popular book on controlled Markov processes and viscosity solutions. And in, in 2015, he was elected as a SIAM fellow. His research is wide and varied and covers all aspects related to probability theory, mathematical finance, of course, decisions under certainty, uncertainty, nonlinear PDEs, and so on. And one last little uh, tidbit I'd like to throw in about Meta to make him blush a little bit. He's also a co-editor of the Mathematics and Financial uh, Economics. He's an AE for Finance and Stochastics, SIAM Journal of fi uh, Financial Mathematics, and many other journals. So it's a great pleasure to have Meta here to tell us all about trading impact. So Meta, the floor is yours. I'm going to put the spotlight on you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Uh, 
It's a pleasure to give this first talk. Uh, I will try to do this standing up and we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> and it, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the SIAM activity group on math uh, financial mathematics and engineering to put together uh, this series. I hope that it will uh, it'll become a regular one, maybe even after the, this crazy epidemic goes away. Might not be a bad idea to do this thing uh, from a distance as well. So for that, I would like to thank Igor, August, Agustino, Sebastian, and Ronnie for uh, taking the initiative and getting this, uh, making this happen. And I also see a lot of names over there, friends, that I haven't seen for a long time, but I cannot say hi to everyone individually, so hi to everybody all together. And, and let me start. So I'm going to st turn to uh, start my sharing my, I hope I can, uh, uh, and start showing my PDF files. Uh, it'll take a second. So <clears throat> what I want to do today is to talk about my work on, on uh, transaction cost, uh, price impact and things of that type. This talk came about very quickly, so I want to do, I couldn't prepare something new. So it's gonna be a survey of my work uh, from the last 10 years or so. And this work has been uh, joined with many people, uh, in particular with Bruno, Johannes and Nizar. So I want to thank them all for uh, the great collaboration. And further ado, let me just start telling you what I want to do in this talk. Uh, the thing that I want to do is I'm going to take a financial market, uh, market in which there are frictions, and in particular, there is market impact, price, uh, price impact. And uh, I want to model this, and it has been done over the years, of course, and I want to see how that uh, impacts the investment decisions or hedging decisions. So this is what we've been doing in the last 10 years or so, but the new computational techniques that are coming up is making it really uh, possible to do a lot of high dimensional problems as well. Not only that, because these uh, computational techniques handle complexities quite easily, we can make the models more complex than, than we were used to. So that is a new thing that is really happening in the last uh, few years, in fact. So that makes this type of models more tractable now. So from that perspective, it is exciting. And let me pause a second over here and then ask at least Sebastian or the others whether the voice and the uh, everything is okay. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. So let me continue. So this is what I want to do. And I start with the price impact. What do I mean by the price impact? The first thing is that I think that most of the frictions can be thought about some kind of a price impact. In fact, for example, the other type of frictions that we're very used to is, is transaction cost. And that is really, uh, is really uh, can be thought about price impact as well. So all of them can be put in one framework and that's what I want to do. And once you do that, if there is friction or if there is transaction cost, the market behaves in as, uh, 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 of course it re reacts to this, uh, this friction and the way it does it in many different ways, but in most of the problems that we have seen, like in the work of Leland, uh, way, way much older work of Leland, Fukosawa, or more recent work of Rosenbaum and Tanko, and also in my uh, previous work with Guy Balls, the volatility changes in a way that is related to the uh, uh, study that you're doing, but it changes the, uh, it modifies the volatility somehow. So that is the curious thing. And this seems to be a general theme and I want to highlight that as well. So let me continue. What is uh, price, price impact? If you if, uh, suppose that the price is sitting right here and you have, a, you have some kind of a uh, sale order comes in, the sale order is going to bring, if the, the, the size of the order is large enough, then it will bring the price down immediately and after a while, it, was, it was, tries to go back to the original place, but sometimes it doesn't go all the way up. So there are two types of impacts. One would be the temporary one. That's the one that is really immediately goes back. And there is a permanent one as well. You, in the markets, you see both of them. And 
to be honest, mark, uh, permanent impact is more difficult to handle than the temporary impact. And the other thing that makes it more difficult is that if this uh, relaxation back to, the, uh, back to this level, if it happens immediately, that makes it easier, but that is unrealistic. So there are a lot of uh, parameters one can put to model this behavior. So I'm going to take the easiest case. So I'm going to look at the order book, which is flat. Of course, we know that uh, the, the order book is not flat and it is discrete. There are many things, but it is a good idealization. So we have a bid ask spread. The bid ask spread, as I said, is related to immediately to transaction cost. So the size of this one tells you the proportional transaction cost you have. But the fact that this depth over here is not infinite tells you that there is price impact also. And that is, uh, that is observed like this. So suppose that you, there is a market order of a certain size coming in, uh, the size is X zero. Since I'm thinking that this is continuous uh, limit order, not discrete, immediately it's going to start going in this direction. The price is going to start going in that direction. Again, this is a feature of the, uh, the continuous uh, order book. If it was discrete, it would sit for a while at the bit and then move. Uh, but this is again an idealization. And if this market order is large enough, it's going to move the bid ask spread maybe. And that may not be such a bad uh, model. But again, this is a first order model that the, the more uh, detailed models have been uh, made. And uh, I'm going to stick to this for a while. So that you see that the, the, the size of the uh, price impact depends on X zero. And then from this uh, little picture, you can immediately find out what uh, the price impact is gonna be. So the price impact is this difference here. You can calculate it very easily from this formula here. So that brings the idea of a supply curve. Supply curve is the, uh, is, is the way that tells me how much the price is going to move when a certain size of a uh, the market order comes into the, uh, the market. So the model that, in fact, this is the model, maybe the very first one is goes back to Chetin, Gerald and Prater about 15 years ago or so. But of course there was this, this idea was there all the time in the mathematical finance uh, literature, the, they were the first maybe. So we think that there is a supply curve the supply curve depends on, of course, time, the spot price that we have, and, all the, and also the uh, size of the market order. So the, the spot price over here is simply just the uh, price that if you don't, the, if there is no market order coming into the place. And with this, uh, with new, there is certain monotonicity that's really obvious. So the one of the ones that one can use is the usual Black-Scholes model that I will use. And I'm going to take uh, this one or sometimes a linearization of this model. Uh, so you see that as uh, you have a new coming into the market, the price goes up. As you're trying to buy, the price is going up on you. And the parameter lambda here is telling us the strength of this movement. Or, and in other words, it would be related to the depth of this, this book, uh, order book. So lambda would be one over this, this parameter, for example, in this case. So uh, the, another uh, simple uh, example would be the linear example or the uh, linearization of the exponential one. If you take a linear uh, price impact, and that's exactly the uh, order book that I have shown you, in that case, uh, a, a transaction of the size uh, new is going to cost me this much money. Right? So therefore, what happens is that uh, the, 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 the price that you're paying, in addition to the usual one that you're going to pay, is going to be this much. So you're going to pay this much additional amount of money. But then when you see this one, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is quadratic. So if I split my order into two and execute them in tandem, then I will get for each one, I will pay this much additional. 
but two times that would be half of the one that I'm paying here. So this tells me that uh, this price impact can be avoided if you split your order into smaller and smaller pieces and execute them in, in tandem. And this way you can just simply get rid of the price impact and uh, can behave as if there is no, there is no uh, price impact at all. Of course, this is not realistic. Uh, because if you if you remember the picture I showed you about the pr uh, ter permanent impact and and the temporary impact, this splitting assumes that temporary impact there is no permanent impact and temporary impact uh, is immediately coming back to where it was. So there is no time lag between the price goes down and comes up immediately. This is not realistic, of course. And if you want to avoid that, you have to put some resilience into the, into the system. But in the, in the model of uh, Chetim, Pratov, and Jero, they did not do that. And in theory, this was possible to, to avoid the uh, liquidity cost. But let's continue. I mean, it is uh, still a nice, very nice model. And with uh, Umut again, Umut and Nizar, we looked at the following super replication problem to see whether uh, one can really uh, avoid the liquidity cost in this environment. Of course, as I said, if you assume uh, ideally everything is possible, then you can do it by just simply splitting the orders into smaller and smaller pieces. But we, we made the following assumption. And this, let me, uh, let me show you the model first. This is my model. So the stock price is just usual geometric Brownian motion. And I assume that Z is the portfolio. So maybe I should write that one. This is the portfolio process. This is the portfolio process. I assume that portfolio process has three parts to it. This is, this is somehow the gamma of the process. Uh, this, is the, the, this is the part that is uh, absolutely continuous. It's not going to cause me any trouble in terms of liquidity. And this is the part that is very uh, troublesome in terms of market impact. These are the uh, jumps in the portfolio of a certain size. And these are done at the times tau n. And in fact, most likely these things are not going to be optimal to have. This doesn't cause me uh, any problem in terms of, uh, in terms of liquidity or uh, liquidity premium, but this term over here is needed. Uh, and <clears throat> what, what we assumed with Umut and Nizar is that we assumed that the portfolio process has this form. Again, you can drop this one out because it's not going to be optimal, but we assume that it has this gamma over here and gamma is somehow not too wild. So we're not saying it is bounded by 510, but it is kind of a nice process, this gamma over here. And then we asked the question, and then once you have this Z process, you can calculate the um, uh, the, the wealth of the portfolio, or the total uh, mark to market value of the portfolio, it will be given the usual uh, stochastic integral over here, and these will be the uh, liquidity costs. So this one over here is a large cost coming from the uh, jumps in the portfolio process. So you have this uh, liquidity premium over here being taken away from the uh, uh, total wealth. And you also have uh, this liquidity premium coming from the gamma of the process as well. This was derived in the paper of uh, Chetin, Jarrow, and Prater. It follows uh, rather directly by just uh, some approximation arguments. So I'm not going to show this one here. You can find it in their paper. But there is a, part, uh, there is a liquidity premium related to this part. Although this part is, is, is not causing the portfolio process to jump, still you have a liquidity pre premium related to gamma, but there is nothing related to alpha in this premium here. So you really want to keep your portfolio to be just alpha and don't have any gamma and Z over here, but although you can get rid of this one, it's not easy to get rid of this one. And then we look at, you could do many things with this model over here. So this is our model coming from 
uh, Jero, uh, Chet in Jero and Prater. With this market, you can try to do hedging or utility maximization uh, or many other things. The first thing we looked at uh, with Umut and Nizar was super replication. What would be the minimal cost if I want to super replicate a given portfolio with probability one? So this is the hardest utility maximization problem you can think of in a way. And it turns out that to our surprise in a way that we couldn't get rid of this one in order, uh, when trying to super replicate a claim and I'm not going to show you the details of it, but there was some viscosity analysis that went with that. The PD characterization of this function, and maybe I should also point out that this uh, minimal super replication cost would be a function of time and S, and maybe it would be a function of the initial portfolio over here, but that you can show that is not important. You can move away from the initial portfolio by small steps without causing any liquidity premium. So it only depends on TNS. What I said requires proof. It's not immediately obvious, but it can be done. And the PD characterization of this, uh, of this function is the following. Uh, if I didn't have any beta over here, I'm taking R equal to zero. Uh, Without, without beta over here, you would have the, the usual Black-Scholes formula. Because, I'm sorry, if you don't have beta uh, and lambda over here, just uh, remove uh, beta and lambda, what you're left with is the usual Black-Scholes formula. So when you have liquidity, uh, constraint or if there is a price impact in the market, then the super replication cost is, is solving something the, different than the usual black shows. And it is given like that. This one over here. And if the, the payoff is convex like a call or a put, you can show easily that the solution V as a function of S is convex, uh, con uh, convex as well. And that one simplifies the, the calculations here and you get this equation. This one over here. When uh, G is a convex uh, function. And this one, I want to write it in the following way. So this maximization can be done and it's equal to that, but I'm going to write that one as like a Black-Scholes equation with a modified volatility. So that is what I said at the beginning of the lecture that the friction generally changes the volatility and you have an effective volatility. In this case, the effective volatility is equal to the original one increased by a certain amount. This is an increase because it's a convex function. And, and this is the gamma if you want. Uh, it is increased by uh, an amount proportional to gamma and also I an mean, amount proportional to the liquidity parameter. The, the, the smaller this parameter is, smaller capital lambda is, the more liquid the market is as well. This is exactly the kind of things that Leland and Fukusawa found also. A similar thing happens for uh, convex payoff also. So the first thing I want to take away from this calculation that I did with Umut and, and Nizar is Although you could uh, get rid of the liquidity premium by making this smaller and smaller, if you insist that your portfolio has this particular form, then you cannot do that. That is technically interesting because the way you get rid of the liquidity premium is philosophically it's easy. You just make it smaller and smaller. You cut everything into smaller pieces, but at the same time, in the case of a black shows, for example, you're trying to hedge a, a call option, the portfolio is going to be a function of the Brownian motion, so it is moving quite a lot. So the, 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 the construction that is done to show that there is no liquidity premium in the paper of Chetin, uh, Chetin Gerald Prater, and also a paper by Peter Bank and Baum, uh, 
they do Borel Cantelli type of constructions and the, uh, the, the, the resulting hedge is quite wild. In particular, it doesn't have a finite gamma. So that is the uh, main, main constraint that we have over here. We want to have a nice gamma. And when you insist that, then you cannot really get rid of the uh, liquidity premium and you have to modify your volatility and pay a price higher than black shorts. So it's hard to do this thing without an audience, by the way. <laughs> that is, I don't know, the, I, I can't get the reaction. So, <laughs> so let me continue. The liquidity premium over here is the following. I mean, let's look at the convex case here. This equation over here, uh, since this uh, sigma hat, the effective volatility is larger than the original volatility, that max, by maximum principle, you can show that the solution to this equation V is going to be bigger than the uh, solution to the Black Scholes equation. And therefore, you have this inequality unless G is a FI function, and there is liquidity premium. And the other points I have already talked about it. And without resilience, on the other hand, uh, if you go to other type of utility maximization problems, uh, this result goes away and the li liquidity premium goes away. The only reason you see it in this, in this particular problem with super replication is that utility function is really very, uh, very non-smooth. If you take a usual utility function like a power type and exponential type, then you will not see a liquidity premium in the model of uh, Jero, uh, Chet and Jero and Prater. So Chet and Jero Prater model has liquidity premium only when you look at uh, super replication in other words. So if you want to see liquidity premium and which is a regular thing because we know that uh, Chettinger of Prater is an idealization. There is no resilience over there. And therefore, you have to bring in the resilience. Otherwise, you're not going to see liquidity premium, which is not realistic. So the next uh, section of the talk is going to start looking at things with resilience. So maybe that's a good time to take a pause and take a question or two, if there is any. Sebastian? Yeah, sure. So far, no, no uh, questions yet. But uh, let me ask the audience, are there any pressing questions that uh, you'd like, like uh, Meta to address at this point? We can just wait a few seconds before it takes a while. Someone asks, what is beta? Binju, uh, probably okay. something on the previous slide. Oh yeah, when you had the, the, the PDE characterization in the soup over beta. Okay, you do, what is there? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, beta is, uh, this comes as a, uh, so we start with this uh, super replication problem, and I want to characterize this one somehow. And this is a function of TNS, you can show that, so there must be some kind of a PD behind that. And we go ahead and do discuss the analysis. And that comes out of that one. I mean, I don't, I don't have an interpretation of beta. It just, you take a soup, it was, I don't remember in the analysis how it was, it was coming from, of course, liquidity, but mm -hmm. just a way to characterize the, uh, the, uh, the value for, or the, the super replication function. So I don't have any deep insight into beta. Mm -hmm. And maybe just a quick one, since you're on this uh, slide here. So the VSS, you said, when it's convex, you indeed have that sigma hat squared is bigger than sigma squared. But even for non-convex payoffs, you say that it's indeed also larger? Yes, it is larger. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can calculate this, in fact, if you look at this uh, nonlinearity over here, it's a function of VSS only. So it is some kind of a Hamiltonian over here mm -hmm. or, or a nonlinear function of VSS, which is explicitly available. And it has, it, it has a strange, uh, uh, strange structure but definitely in the non k case, definitely you will have a liquidity premium. You do have it. Hey, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry? In the was... context case, mm -hmm. you have this, um, I mean, nicer interpretation of the equation with the sure. effective volatility. In the concave case, I think you, lost, you lose that, uh, mm. See. that interpretation. 
Okay, and there's and this will perhaps be the last uh, question for the for the break in the middle. Uh, Tadeusz uh, Cernek asks, "What about the no dynamic arbitrage?" Uh, here, there is no dynamic. I mean, I don't. Uh, the arbitrage is not here. I mean, that is uh, the model doesn't have arbitrage because there is liquidity premium also. In the best of the cases, you you get rid of the liquidity premium and that is the best you can do. But in general, there is no arbitrage because the original uh, Black Scholes model doesn't have arbitrage. And then here I have on top of that, there is liquidity premium. So there is no, you're not going to be able to do arbitrage anyways. But in the best of the worlds, you lose, uh, you get rid of the liquidity premium. And I'm saying that if you restrict your portfolios a little bit, assuming that they should have a, a nice gamma over here, then, uh, then you really cannot get rid of uh, this part either. So from arbitrage point of view, this, this, uh, this model is uh, airtight. Okay, great. So uh, Meta, why don't you continue on? It's uh, going great so far. That brings me to the next, uh, next step with, with penalizing the speed. And the model that is really, uh, that has been adopted by the community is the one that, is, that was proposed by Angren and Chris, again, goes back to 15 years or so, I guess. And uh, there were also a paper by Rogers and Sin, and, and in the finance literature, there's a very nice paper by Garleneo and Peterson. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my supply curve to be not a function of the, uh, the, the market order, but this is the derivative of the change in my portfolio. So this is a stronger market impact, in fact. So in the previous model, I could change my portfolio at any speed I, uh, I wanted. I would pay something because I was moving, but I could do things with infinite speed. Here, I'm not allowing things to happen in with infinite speed. And the larger the speed is, the more you're going to pay in terms of liquidity. So this is another, this might not be the best model either from very pure, uh, modeling point of view, but it is very nice because it captures the uh, resilience very nicely into, into the model. So from that perspective, if we really want to put resilience into the model, this is a nice model. There are other models in between, but they are much more complicated. So this one, uh, the model of uh, Angren and Chris captures this uh, resilience in a very nice way and, and gives us a model which is tractable. Then the liquidity premium. So I use this one uh, with a prime up there and I even confuse myself. So let me point out, this is this one over here. The, uh, it is just Z prime is really the derivative, time derivative of the portfolio. I'm assuming that the portfolio is a very nice function. In the previous slides, Z was jumping. It had a gamma to it and all these things. Now here, there is nothing. If you go back, so I know it may not be the right thing to do, but uh, if you go to this model right here, I could have only this term. This terms and that term is, is not allowed uh, because they would have infinite speed, those two things. And I only allow this part over here. But in, a, but, uh, in this model over here, in the model of Jero, uh, Chetin, Jero and Prader, Alpha was not giving me any liquidity premium, but now in the model of Unger and Chris, that's not the case. Alpha is penalized. As you see over here, alpha over here is Z prime, nothing but the Z prime. So I'm, I'm really having alpha in my, uh, in my liquidity premium over here. So that is the new, new, new model. It's quite different than the previous model. Okay, again, I have a lambda over here, which is a parameter of liquidity. The larger the lambda, the, the more illiquid the market is. So what we want to do with this model. Okay, here I can, it is uh, here I want to do utility maximization and uh, see what the impact of this model is on my, uh, on my optimal portfolio. So the first thing is that let me uh, point out, I'm going to use this notation, theta star is gonna be the optimal portfolio in the frictionless market. You can always do that problem, I'm assuming, and I, you can always calculate theta star. But now I want to understand if the market is not, uh, is not liquid 
uh, which allowed me to compute this one. If it is not, what would be the impact on my optimal portfolio position? Now, you can either uh, take your utility from the final wealth, this one over here, but when you come to the final time point, your portfolio position may not be at the optimal uh, or, or at an ideal place. So you may want to take that into account. There are many ways of doing it. Doing it. Schoenborn uh, proposed this, this uh, modification and, and we, uh, we also took that one as well. So you take the final portfolio position, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for final wealth value and you subtract from this one uh, an amount proportional to the distance between where you want to be, which is theta star, and where you are. And C over here is a constant and lambda is the liquidity parameter. I mean, this will make the analysis a little bit better. It's not really so crucial, but it makes sense to put some kind of a modification over here. I'm not insisting on this particular one. This one made our analysis slightly easier, but as a correction or a penalization due to the, the fact that you're not at the right portfolio position should be done, I guess. So what is U over here? U is just any utility function that you would like. So I want to solve this problem. And what are the difficulties? Well, of course, lambda equal to zero is my benchmark and theta star is the optimal portfolio. I want to be close to that one. But I cannot do that because theta star in many, in many cases could be very wild and I may not be able to get there uh, or, or track it uh, perfectly because my, my uh, portfolios have to be uh, differentiable and theta star may not be uh, differentiable. Or maybe if you start far away from theta star at the beginning, you have to catch up to theta star and that would be the initial liquidity cost. And since you cannot just jump to theta star right away, that is also it's going to give you an initial liquidity cost. So there are these problems. And uh, this is again a usual uh, um, stochastic optimal control problem. It's Markovian. It is Markovian in the following variables. S, of course, time is always a variable. S is the stock position. Y is the wealth position, and you really have to keep track of the portfolio position as well, because you cannot change your portfolio immediately. So it is a state variable as well. So you already have three st uh, state variables and time. So you have a problem with three plus one. 10 years ago, it was an impossible problem, but now I see Yosef's smiling face over there. He can do this problem in no time. Uh, but so it is, it is a nonlinear PD. With old PD techniques, this is a difficult problem. It's a three-dimensional problem, and I can complicate this problem, which in the paper that I wrote with Ludovic and, and Johannes, we did look at factor models. For example, you take the stock price dynamics depend on a, uh, on a parameter or a, or, a, or a factor. And also, for example, in the paper of Galileo and Peterson, they were, that was very crucial that they had a factor model. And in this recent paper, we have taken a lot more complicated uh, models. And then the PD would be more complicated and you may have uh, more uh, variables as well. But you can write down the PD on the other hand. That's what I want to say. I mean, this is, these problems are utility maximization problems are standard optimal control problems. There is a procedure that you can write down the PD. Of course, it is coupled with a final condition. I'm not writing that. So the, the recent work by the group of FAM, Huyan FAM, or the group Wine and A and Han in, 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 uh, at Princeton or at ETH, Yosef's group and Lucas and Yosef looked at this type of problems, they can solve them. So that is new. I mean, I think that we haven't exploited this new potential uh, to its fullest yet because it's uh, recent, but I think there is a lot of potential there and I want to emphasize that. But in the old days, we didn't. So what we did with Ludovic and, and, and Johannes is to do uh, asymptotics. We just look at the case where lambda is there, but not very large. So let's do asymptotics. 
That is also, even if you have computational power, that may not be a bad idea to do because that may tell you where to start from anyways, for example, for your calculations. And, and I'm not going to show you the analysis. It is a viscosity analysis that I have developed with NISAR in the past 10 years or so. And the interesting thing is not what happens to the value function, but what happens to the optimal portfolio. The optimal portfolio where lambda is equal to zero, lambda equal to zero is a perfectly liquid case. It's equal to theta star. I assume that I know this thing. In many cases we do. And if lambda is bigger, you want to be close to theta star. But you cannot, as I said, I mean, if you're not there, you're not going to just jump on to theta star right away because you have to be time uh, differentiable. And even if theta star is differentiable, maybe its derivative is too large and moving too much and you're paying too much to liquidity. Because remember, liquidity cost is uh, proportional to the square of the time derivative of your portfolio. If the, square, if the L2 norm of this one is too large, you don't want to follow it in, uh, exactly. And the asymptotic analysis says that the optimal portfolio, of course, this is not exactly equal in, uh, in an asymptotic manner, is trying to track theta star, but not exactly. You're trying to shoot at theta star, but you're not going there immediately, and you just follow it. And the uh, smaller the lambda is, the closer you, you follow theta star. So that comes from analysis. And the constant over here is related to risk tolerance. That's another interesting thing that risk tolerance uh, process appears in this uh, asymptotic analysis often. And I have seen that in the work of uh, Jean-Pierre and Ronnie and, and also in the work of Talia. This, uh, this risk law tolerance process appears, and it does appear in this analysis as well. And the outcome of this analysis, which I didn't show you, if you want to do utility maximization with, uh, with price impact, then the price impact is uh, stopping you to do the best you can, this one over here, but you try to stay close to it in the following way. So this is different than the model of uh, Chettinger and Prater because we put uh, resilience into the, into the system. Because of that, there is always liquidity premium in all utility maximization problems and your portfolio position is changed in the following way. You can quantify it, but I think instead of quantifi uh, quantification, the general qualitative behavior is, is interesting. So, <clears throat> So what I want to do now is try to understand this uh, phenomena a little bit better. And what happens, how do I do hedging? So we were trying to understand that problem with Peter Beck and Maurice Watts uh, a while back. And we realized that maybe the problem we should be asking is not to do the utility maximization problem, but just uh, abstract the problem and consider a different problem related and in the case of an exponential utility they are equivalent in some cases but i'm going to look at a similar problem now in the utility maximization problem theta star was the optimal portfolio for the frictionless model and we thought that okay when i'm doing a utility maximization with price impact i should be close to theta star but now i'm going to say that directly just I don't care what kind of utility is doing. What I want to do is I want to stay close to theta star because that's the optimal thing I want to do. But I cannot do it because there is price impact. So I, I think that I'm given a, a portfolio process theta star. In, in, the, in the previous case, it was coming as the frictionless uh, maximizer of my utility maximization problem. But here I don't care. It's just like, okay, I'm given that and try to stay close to it. In what way? Well, this is what an engineer would do in, in you know, image uh, signal processing. So Z is the one that I'm trying to uh, construct and theta star is given. So it's like image processing. This is a noisy image and I want to find the image. So 
you try to be close in the L2 sense. Why L2? Because it's easier, as you see. Uh, I'm trying to simplify the previous problem. So that's why I'm trying to take things. And then I penalize my, my portfolio over here by the square root of its derivative, just like in the previous case. So I'm trying to uh, imitate what I did in the previous problem, but make it more tractable and without really referring to any utility problem. But there is lambda over here, which is important. If lambda is zero, I would just simply take z equal to theta star, right? Theta lambda over here is somehow the gearing factor, how much uh, weight you put on the penalization here. So it is a little bit losing the uh, meaning of liquidity premium, but you can still think in those terms. Again, z prime over here is the derivative of this function. And this is really related to what Rogers was doing in this paper about 10 some years ago. And <clears throat> so this is a problem. So you give me an initial point. Uh, well, the initial point is not, initial point would be the initial point of Z over here. Or, no, I put a Z, this should be Z, I'm sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> And I want to minimize, I want to minimize the expected value of this cost. So that is the problem we look at. That seems like a very similar problem. And uh, we were surprised that we could solve that problem explicitly. So what I'm trying to do over here is that maybe I didn't write this, so let me say it in words at least. I'm trying to minimize the expected value of this cost overall differentiable portfolio processes Z. These are scalar valued processes of time. Uh, and the solution is the following form. This is, this is wrong. Uh, good thing that I can do that. This is Z star. Sorry, not theta star, sorry. Or you know what? So, <clears throat> The, this is an explicit solution, and I can tell you what this uh, operator is as well in the paper of, uh, with, with Peter and Moritz, it's explicit, the written. And in fact, Peter and Moritz extended this analysis to more complicated cases as well. Again, I'm trying to do the same thing as what's same as the previous uh, problem that we did with utility maximization. Z star is trying to get close to theta star but you cannot do it because theta star could be rough and you may not be able to follow it directly. Because of that, you, uh, you just try to get close to it. And it's, as lambda gets smaller, then you can get closer to theta. In fact, this L over here depends on lambda as well. As lambda goes to zero, this operator over here goes to the value of theta star at T and Z star becomes equal to theta star t, but lambda is not zero and you, you try to follow it. And this lambda L theta star is some kind of an average of feature values of uh, theta star. Of course, we are, in, we are in a probabilistic setting. I don't want this thing to be the non-adapted. What this uh, operator is, is it looks at the feature values of theta star it averages them in a certain way and take conditional expectations. So this is the best, somehow this is the best uh, estimate of the future weighted future values of theta star. And you try to go towards, not towards theta star itself right now, but to an average value of the theta star in the future. And this is exactly what Garlaneo and Peterson found in their paper. It's a very nice paper. It has a lot of applications that you can do. It's a uh, factor model where they can use uh, this type of ideas to get some portfolio uh, processes. So that's all I wanted to say. Again, this, this operator is explicit. You can find it in our paper. And it has the same structure as the previous one, except that previous one, the, the, the utility maximization solution was trying to get towards to the value of the theta right now. The next observation that we do over here is that 
that's not the best thing to do. You should really look into the future and try to target the future. And with that, I'm going to show one picture. I, I have overused this picture. I want to do it today for, for two other reasons. It's a good picture. This is a quote of Galena and Peterson of Wayne Gretzky, and you can appreciate that, Sebastian. It's Canadian. <laughs> In Pittsburgh, they have a different uh, hockey player, maybe. <laughs> it says that a great hockey player skates to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. So the reason I'm using it again right there, that I wish that somebody told that to President Trump a year and uh, about two months ago. So, and as Joseph says, I mean, things move really fast. If you try to go there, the puck is going to be very, very different as we are seeing right now. So with that, let me conclude with a couple of remarks. And I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, so this is equilibrium very briefly. There are a lot of very good people working on equilibrium problems related to that. This is my uh, view of it from, the, from my interactions with Johannes, really. Johannes and his collaborators uh, has done a lot of work. Uh, Kasper Larsen and Gordon has done work on these things. Kasper with UN SAPI as well. This paper with, uh, uh, of uh, Zitkovic and Singh, uh, Howe and Gordon, is a very beautiful paper using very deep PD analysis. So there is a lot of different type of mathematics in these papers, and I'm sure that there are others as well. This is just a, so, and with the new technology that, that's being developed, like the paper, in the papers of uh, Yosef and his collaborators, you can do really, uh, maybe not analytical, but numerical uh, studies as well for the equilibrium. And, the, my conclusions of this one is I have said many, many times, of course, leak price impact is kind of fun and you can do a lot of, uh, you can construct a lot of more realistic models with it. Asymptotics is always useful, even if you can solve it with the new technologies, it gives you a benchmark maybe. And this new computational techniques is extremely important, I think, especially in this model because our PDs are generally very ugly and very difficult to handle. So with that, let me stop and thank you for your uh, attention. And these are the papers that I used throughout the, uh, this talk. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you, Meta. That was uh, fantastic. Um, so there are a couple of questions already lined up in the, in the chat box, but uh, please do you, uh, uh, if you have some more, please do send them in here and I'll uh, select a few of them. Okay, you sell it, right? I yes, see, yes. But, you know, I might be able to see Okay, it. so um, let's see. Okay, one question is from uh, Yel Yelis, Yelis Yokolo. Um, Yokolo, I don't see the full name showing up here for some reason. Uh, it says, how does the supply curve behave if there are several assets from the penalty perspective? I think you can do many models over there, and I don't know offhand right now who has done it. Uh, yes, you have to take into account the, the, the color, uh, uh, interactions and color, uh, not color, uh, covariance matrices of the, uh, of the, of the uh, stocks. I think uh, from a theoretical point of view, you can, you can uh, model it in many ways. And in the paper that this paper, for example, was looking at a higher dimensional model also, and you could put some uh, in the, in the Algren Chris type of a model, you can easily do it instead of taking the derivative square, you take a quadra uh, quadratic form of the derivative. Derivative is not mm -hmm. an N dimensional vector and you can do that. So yeah. how do you, how do you uh, uh, calibrate to the data uh, is, is going to be more difficult, of course, in that case. Here, lambda is some one parameter, and you think that, oh, it is the liquidity parameter, and the, the, the larger it is, the less liquid that one. So in that way, you can have uh, calibration. Uh, you can do calibration. And in fact, the work of uh, Robert uh, Angren, he was, he was getting it from the market data anyways. But that was one dimension. Higher dimensional calibration would be more difficult. But Theoretically, you can do it. Okay, uh, then there's a question from uh, uh, Bilgi 
Yilmaz says, is there, is there no riskless, is there a riskless asset or not in the portfolio? Uh, okay, that's Bilge, first of all. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't pronounce that. But... <laughs> that's a difficult one for me. Bilge is not, it's for me, it's, it's a big <laughs> thing. I mean, yes, there is a, a riskless portfolio. I took R equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And I think in my papers, maybe we were taking, uh, uh, but we were just simply taking a constant interest rate in, this, in these models. Uh, depends on this, the, the time scale of our problem, whether that's relevant or not. We weren't looking into that directly, mm -hmm. but it can be, I guess. But that makes it even more complex. That brings my point of modern computational techniques. You can throw that in right now, make the PD even higher dimension, but you can stop. And a question from uh, Jiang Feng Zhang. Uh, I think Z star may not be close to theta star, even if theta star is smooth, in bracket, unless it's a constant. Yes? Question mark. Uh, even if it is constant, you may not be equal to that one because you, if you don't start right on top of a constant, you have to get to the constant somehow. So it's going to take some time to get to that one. And it will be an exponential uh, convergence to that one. And the, the rate at which you converge depends on lambda. That is what these uh, functions are telling me. Right. This lambda is telling me how fast the exponential rate is. If it is smooth, again, it smooth doesn't smooth, but maybe L2 norm of the derivative is very large. Then you may not like that. You will try to stay close to it, but smoother than uh, smoother than theta star itself. In fact, in the paper of uh, Peter uh, Bank, uh, this paper that oh, you didn't, you're not seeing my. This, this is not moving anymore. No, it's not. Maybe you'd stop sharing and reshare again. Yeah, that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. No. Yeah. Yep, it's working again. So the, this paper of, uh, in this paper over here, I should have taken some of the pictures, but even when it is, uh, uh, we took two, two, several examples there. One was constant, even in constant, as I said, you, you come to it, but in an exponential one. And the other example was, it was two constants, but you jumped. Theta star was one constant, another one. So you come closer to that one, and then you have to go up to that one. So a lot of things can happen, and you have an explicit formula in the in this particular model. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions from the audience. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, how about, uh, well, in normal situations, we'll say, let's thank Meta and all give a nice applause. <laughs> and then we go out for a great dinner. Well, I yeah. guess lunch because it's two o'clock. But yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, this is this is a very odd situation. We won't be doing that. I see a lot of uh, excellent thanks, uh, Meta, showing up in the text box there. So that's in place of the, the applause. Um, just before we, we all go, I just wanted to say something uh, about another seminar series that some of you may be interested in that start, that's starting up alternating with our SIAM series. So there's uh, the Bachelet Finance Society will be also hosting a seminar series at the exact same time in alternating weeks on Thursdays at 1 p.m. So uh, look out for that information. Uh, they, uh, Joseph and, uh, and Jean-Pierre has uh, asked me to, to let everyone know about it. And uh, we're, we're all working together to keep our community uh, vibrant and active in, this, in these very isolating days. And I, um, I, we're, we're hoping that both uh, take off and, and we get great attendance like we did today. Our maximum, we, it fluctuated throughout the, throughout the talk, but the, I think the maximum was somewhere around 215 attendees, which is quite excellent. And um, looking forward to, uh, to our next uh, session, which we'll be announcing soon. Um, and uh, keep a, a lookout for the email list. Uh, Augustino, do you have anything to add? You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. So I'm very happy about uh, how the seminar went. I think it was a great, uh, great talk by Matt. Thanks for uh, giving mm -hmm. it. And also, I mean, I think, as you said, we had about 225, even 230 attendees, like as a maximum. So mm -hmm. 
great. I mean, I, I look forward to having other talks of this type uh, as we go on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks again, Meta, and thank you, everybody. So have a wonderful rest of the afternoon, evening, or night. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. see you soon. Okay. Bye -bye. See you soon. Thank bye -bye. you again. Uh, bye bye. Yeah. <laughs>